to let you all know the way that this defense works is I'll give a brief introduction um, right now, and then Kayla will give her presentation. At the end of the presentation, there'll be a little bit of time for um, the committee and the public to ask questions. Uh, then we'll kick the public out of Zoom and the committee will have a closed session meeting with Kayla to talk more about her thesis. And then we'll kick Kayla out and we'll have a more discussion as a committee, a vote, and then bring Kayla back in and um, that will be that. Uh, and so um, let's see, so Kayla started in my lab in uh, fall 2018. She came here with um, a bachelor's in environmental studies from UNC Chapel Hill which usually when I say that, UNC Chapel Hill, it incites booze, but those booze don't really shine through on Zoom very well. Or maybe that's when we talk about Duke, everybody booze. It's one or the other. Um, I don't know, a fun fact about, not so much about Kayla, but maybe about my lab. So Kayla is the sixth um, master's student that will have come through my lab. She's the second identical twin. Um, so I, I had a student a few years back who was an identical twin and, and so is Kayla. And so that's always made for an interesting first six months with an identical twin student, especially when that identical twin is also a student in the program. So I can remember early on, I'd walk around campus and I would see Kayla walking around campus and I'd stop and say hi. And I'd have this person looking at me like, who are you? Um, and I realized a few months in, oh, wait. Nicole is Kayla's identical twin and she has no idea who I am. <laughs> um, and so I'd like to say I'm a little bit better at telling them apart, but COVID has kind of hit and with a mask on, I probably stand zero chance um, at this point. Um, and so let's see, so, um, so Kayla joined my lab in, in fall 2018. Um, she did um, her field work, like most of the work you're gonna see her present on was split between the summer of 2019 where uh, she collected part of her data and then, um, and then the summer of 2020, which is the other part of her data. And of course, between there, COVID hit and, and threw everything for a loop. Um, and so a lot of what you're gonna see her present is data that she collected during COVID um, restrictions. So we were like some of the first people to be allowed on Sullivan's Island to do work out on the dunes. Um, she was the first person I physically had in my research lab collecting data. And so we, we figured that all out. And she really did a great job of um, really working independently to make sure that all of this stuff happened and happened at a really high quality level. Um, and I'll say that, you know, master's theses are always a, a lot of work. It's a huge hill to climb. Doing this during COVID and doing all these meetings on Zoom and trying to really keep momentum has been tough. Kayla has done a phenomenal job. Um, she'll give a really nice presentation here today over her results. And um, I think y'all will be really impressed. So go ahead, Kayla, take it away. Thank you, that was a very nice introduction. Okay, I'm going to share my screen. Okay, hopefully you all see it. I'm guessing so, but you bet. Okay, so hi everyone. Thank you for coming to my thesis event. Um, today I'll be talking about the relationship between locomotive performance and habitat use and supplied race runners in coastal South Carolina. So I want to take a quick moment to thank my advisor, Dr. McElroy, for all of his help, support, and patience, patience throughout this project. I couldn't have done it without you. And I'm also very grateful for the support from the rest of my committee, as well as all of the EVSS faculty. And I also want to thank my family and my friends, especially my parents, my sister, for their continued love and support during this project and throughout grad school and my life in general. And I'm also very grateful for my faith because I couldn't have gotten through this season without it. So here is an outline of today's presentation. I'll start with a brief introduction and then I'll segue into the method results and then discussion. And at the end, there will be a Q&A session so you can save all of your questions until then. How organisms are distributed in time and space is a fundamental question in ecology. This distribution depends on a variety of factors, including life cycle, mating, migration, competition, predators, food abundances, climate, topography, and habitat. Habitats are especially critical to animal distribution because they provide basic resources and can influence an animals' physiological capacities, ecological performance, and reproductive rates. Therefore, the distribution of animals in an area may largely reflect the quality of habitat and the resources it provides. 
One way animals access their habitat is through locomotion. Habitat can affect an animal's locomotion in a variety of ways, including impeding it, making movement more apparent and riskier, and decreasing the need for movement due to cover and resource availability. Since an animal's ecology is impacted by its habitat and habitat affects its locomotion, locomotion is often a critical component of survival. And lizards are common test subjects in locomotion studies because they express a wide range of locomotor behaviors and abilities. So there are several factors that affect lizard locomotion. Natural substrates vary extensively in structure and texture. And these variations require animals to use different locomotor strategies in order to maneuver over them effectively. Structural complexity can affect the efficiency of each step taken. Unevenness can cause animals to adjust their velocity, posture, and transmission of forces. Inclines can affect sprint speed by requiring lizards to use more energy to travel the same distance. Smoother surfaces are easier for lizards to cling to than rougher surfaces. Obstacles can also affect locomotion. Obstacles are common in complex habitats and can alter a lizard's locomotion by placing demands on its time and energy and by impeding them visually and physically. Perturbations of any type can force lizards to employ control strategies such as bipedalism, jumping, and speed alterations so that they can recover from these interferences without substantially altering their locomotion. Lizards also have to make decisions while escaping that can affect their survival. To keep from being seen and approached by predators, lizards use crypsis. When they are approached by a predator, lizards go through an extensive cost-benefit analysis to determine if and when they should flee. This analysis considers both intrinsic and extrinsic factors, as well as energy expenditure, claim of territory, and reproductive and foraging opportunities. When the threat of predation is greater than the benefits of remaining in place, a lizard will flee. The success of the escape will depend on the lizard's speed and maneuverability over its chosen route, which will be partially dictated by the surrounding habitat. The speed a lizard chooses can also affect their locomotion. Speed affects the amount of time and energy expended, as well as the success rate of each task. Lizards rarely achieve maximum sprint speed in nature because it requires a lot of energy, can reduce their safety, and can restrict maneuverability. However, Higher speeds can be advantageous for attaining a high social status, chasing prey, and escaping predators. A lizard speed should therefore be a compromise between multiple factors and should reflect the task they are conducting and the substrate they are utilizing. Gait also affects locomotion. Bipedalism, or running on hind limbs instead of all four limbs, is a common trait among lizards. Species vary in the frequency they run bipedal, with some species using it often, while others prefer to run quadrupedal or running on all four legs. Research shows that bipedalism does not affect speed, but it has been associated with higher acceleration and can be advantageous when crossing a single obstacle. So there have been many studies on lizard locomotion, but only a small subset focuses on variable substrates. So the goal of this study was to examine the relationship between locomotor performance and habitat use six line race runners to quantify how they are impacted by variable substrates in a coastal setting. Six line race runners are fast runners and rely on rapid locomotion to escape predators. They are active foragers that cover a wide area in search of food and mates, which suggests they encounter an array of substrates and microhabitats during a typical day. This makes them an ideal species to test on variable substrates. So I use three questions to guide my research. The first was, do race runners move th through their habitat randomly or non-randomly? The second was, how does available habitat affect their locomotion? And the third was, is the pattern observed in question one explained by question two? So to achieve my goal, I used habitat assessment data to learn about the habitat race runners encounter in nature, and I use laboratory and field trials to understand their locomotor performance in artificial and natural environments. Now I'll talk about the methods. So I'll start by talking about the habitat assessment. So to quantify the available habitat race runners can occupy, I conducted a habitat assessment on the sand dunes on Sullivan's Island. Sullivan's Island is a barrier island off the coast of South Carolina that is home to a population of race runners. To collect habitat data, I took almost 220 meter long transects of the fore dune and the rear dune 
between stations 18 and 24. I began the transects on the four dune and moved in a general southwest direction along the dune so that I was generally parallel to the beach. When I finished assessing the four dune, I turned around and assessed the rear dune. Each transect began where the previous transect ended, and I used a measuring tape to mark each transect so that I could visually categorize and record habitat types directly along the transect line. And the map on the right shows the start and end points of all the transects. So the habitat categories were determined based on preliminary walking surveys of the available habitat. Five centimeter increments were chosen as they are, were relevant for the body size of race runners. I also recorded obstacles and the presence of cover. So now I'll move on to the laboratory experiment. So I collected 22, race, 22 male and female race runners from Sullivan's Island. And I only collected adults that were not pregnant. I found lizards by walking haphazard transects on the dunes in suitable habitat. Once found, I captured lizards via handheld noose. In the lab, I placed a temporary small adhesive reflective sticker on their back between their hind limbs. And you can see the sticker in this picture. I kept the lizard warm in an incubator between runs on the racetrack. After the lizard had finished all their trials, I weighed them and measured their snout vent and tail lengths. To prevent recapture in the field, I cut the top one to two millimeters off the tip of each lizard's tail at an angle. Lizards were kept in the lab for a maximum of three days. At night, I placed them in individual aquaria, misted with distilled water, and put them inside the environmental room. After their trials were complete, I released all lizards at the point of their capture. For the lab portion of the study, we built a straight wooden racetrack for the lizards to run in in the lab. I mounted two cameras that recorded at 500 frames per second above the racetrack on a metal frame to record the trial. Camera one recorded the start in the first half of the trials, and camera two recorded the second half into the trials. And then I positioned two halogen lights above the racetrack to provide lighting for the cameras and to ensure that the racetrack surface was near natural environmental temperatures. So inside the racetrack, I tested three substrates sand, which was bare sand with no debris present, mixed, which was sand mixed with debris, and debris, which was debris only. And I used debris that washed up on the beach and collected both it and the sand from Sullivan's Island so that it matched the substrates the lizard would encounter in their natural habitat. At the start of each trial, I removed a lizard from the incubator and placed it at the beginning of the racetrack. I pressed each lizard gently against the substrate with a cupped hand to make it motionless. Once it was still, I tapped the lizard's tail to encourage it to start running, and then I waved my hand up, my hand behind it to encourage it to run to the end of the racetrack, where there was a darkened area to insinuate safety, which you can see in this picture. After each run, the lizards were given time to rest, and each lizard ran on each of the three substrates multiple times, with the goal of obtaining three good trials per lizard per substrate. Only good trials were retained for analysis. Good trials were defined as those where the lizard started running from a standstill, appeared to run at a fast speed with few pauses, and ran relatively straight down the racetrack to the end. So I trimmed and saved all good videos using Motion Studio computer software. An example of one of these videos is this right here. This is an example. Um, so then I pulled the video into MATLAB where I digitized the reflective sticker. And this picture right here shows the digitizing and it's the purple line. So digitizing produced a set of coordinates that designated where the lizard's marker was during each frame of the video. These coordinates were run through a custom script in MATLAB to calculate peak instantaneous velocity and acceleration, total distance ran, and total time ran. Bipedalism was determined by reviewing each video and counting the number of frames when the lizard's front legs were off the ground. So the field data consisted of filmed field escapes of race runners on Sullivan's Island. Escape videos of 20 different lizards were reviewed using QuickTime and Tracker software. So we recorded the amount of ground clutter the lizards crossed and the amount of time they ran on each substrate. Three different substrate types were recorded. 
degree, sand, and mixed, which were all qualitatively similar to those, to those used in the racetrack experiment. And then we calculated average speed per movement. So for the statistical analysis for question one, I sorted habitat assessment data by substrate type and then computed the cumulative amount and relative percentage of each substrate to determine their abundance on Sullivan's Island. And I calculated the amount of cover and number of obstacles on each substrate as well. For the field data, I calculated the percent of time race runners ran on each substrate to establish how frequently they ran on each substrate in the field. And then I conducted a chi-square test comparing the available habitat from the habitat assessment and the used habitat from the field data. So all statistical analyses for question two were conducted using RStudio. So before running the full models, I wanted to determine whether morphology and sex affected the data. So I used linear models to test sex, snout vent length, and tail length in the racetrack trials. For the field data, I didn't have morphological data, so I only tested for sex. Predictor variables that significantly affected velocity or acceleration would be included as subsequent predictors in the full models. Racetrack data were collected from 22 lizards, but three lizards didn't have good runs on every substrate and were excluded from further analysis. Each of the remaining lizards had between one and four good runs on each substrate. I used mixed effects models to test substrate type, gait, their interaction, and lizard ID against peak velocity, peak acceleration, and percent of time the lizards ran bipedal. And for the field data, I used linear models to test speed against substrate type and ground water cross. And now on to the result. So first I'm going to talk about the results from question one, do race runners move through their habitat randomly or non-randomly? So debris was the most common substrate found on the dunes, making up almost half of the substrates analyzed in the habitat assessment. Sand was the most common substrate the lizards ran on in the field, with almost two thirds of their runs being on sand. So the habitat assessment and the field escape data show opposite results. Debris was the most common substrate available in the lizard's natural habitat, but lizards ran on debris the least, and conversely, they ran on sand the most, even though it was the least available substrate. In so therefore, I can determine that race runners use the available substrates non-randomly when escaping. So now I'm going to talk about the results from question two, um, how available habitat affects race runners. So linear models testing for the effects of sex, snout vent length, and tail length in the racetrack trials showed no significant relationship. Therefore, all three of these variables were removed from further analysis, and all data were analyzed together. And in the field data, sex did not affect speed or ground clutter crossed, so male and female data were analyzed together. So first, I'm going to talk about the results from the racetrack trials. The so substrate type significantly affected peak velocity. Two key post hoc tests showed significant differences in peak velocity between gates on the same substrate and also between quadrupedalism on different substrates. There was no significant difference in velocity between gates on debris. And quadrupedal velocity between sand and mixed substrates was not significantly different. Bipedal velocity between all three substrates was also not significantly different. Substrate type did not, significantly, did not significantly affect acceleration, nor did it significantly affect the amount of time lizards ran bipedal. And the percent of time race runners ran bipedal did not significantly affect their peak velocity or their peak acceleration. So here are the results from the field data. The model showed substrate type did not significantly affect speed. However, the amount of ground clutter cross did significantly affect speed. So the more obstacles the lizards crossed over, the faster they ran. In the field study, 69% of movements recorded included an obstacle. And when the lizards encountered an obstacle during a movement, 90% of the time they encountered more than one. So now on to the discussion. So I'm going to focus on three results for the analysis. 
First is that race runners run non-randomly on substrates in the field. The second is that race runners run fastest on debris in the lab, but they run fastest on sand in the field. And the third is that there's a positive correlation between obstacles and speed. So the question now becomes, if race runners can run the fastest on debris, why aren't they doing that in the field? Why are they running on sand instead? It would make sense for them to utilize substrates where their performance is maximized. But for some reason, they aren't doing that. They're not running on the substrate where they can move the fastest. Instead, they're choosing to run on a different substrate, sand. So in order to make sense of this, we must look at what else could be influencing these results. So the most likely explanation is behavior. And it appears as though a lot of their behavior is influenced by cover. Over 90% of cover found in the habitat assessment was located on debris substrates. This means that cover is linked with debris in the field. If lizards behave differently on debris in the field than they did on debris in the lab, it's most likely due to predation pressure and how safe they feel, both of which are influenced by cover. So in the wild, the lizards likely don't feel motivated to run fast over debris because they have cover nearby that can keep them safe from predators. The lab, however, is a different environment. And when they were in the racetrack, they didn't have cover, cover nearby to make them feel safe. So they had to rely on faster speeds for protection instead of relying on cover. And faster speeds on debris could be associated with more obstacles and higher rates of bipedalism. Sandy substrates are not associated with cover and therefore could be the most dangerous substrate for race runners because of this lack of protection. Predation pressure is likely much higher on sand than on debris because sand exposes lizards to predators on all sides, whereas debris with cover can provide shelter. In the lab, the predation pressure was the same regardless of the substrate. In the field, the predation level was probably higher on sand than on debris since debris was also located adjacent to cover. And this study is a good example of the notion that an animal's performance in the lab does not necessarily match their performance in the field. This shows that we need to be careful of, of results observed in the lab because they might not accurately depict what is happening in nature. So a lot of other factors could explain what is happening. And all of these factors are plausible, but for a lot of these, we don't have the data to accurately shed light on whether or not these factors are significant in determining race runner locomotor performance. We can, however, rule out a few things, at least in relation to our study. So for substrate type to fully explain the results, race runners would have to run slowest or fastest on one substrate consistently. And since this didn't occur, substrate type can't be fully. Substrate complexity doesn't appear to be a huge factor because race runners went similar speeds on all three substrates using a bipedal gait. Biomechanics can't fully explain what's happening because the lizards are running different speeds on different substrates and their traction did not change on each substrate. And we know that sex and morphology were insignificant in our data and therefore likely did not greatly affect race runner locomotion in this study. So unfortunately, the study has left us with more questions than answers. But what's really cool about these results is that they are very different from what we expected and from what other studies have we expected lizards to run fastest on sand, both in the lab and in the field. However, that's not what happened. And this shows that their locomotion adjustments are likely due to behavior more than anything else. So now that we have a better understanding of the relationship between locomotor performance and habitat use in fixed line race runners, we have a better idea of what research needs to be conducted to further Pollution will likely be an ongoing problem in the future. So future research should focus on how locomotive performance is affected by unnatural substrates, such as towels and plastic, which are both commonly found in the lizard's habitat on the sand dunes. And further studies on choice experiments in which lizards choose between two or more substrates in the same trial are also needed to better understand why lizards choose certain substrates over others. So just to wrap up, Habitat can greatly impact locomotor performance in lizards. This study examined the relationship between locomotor performance and habitat use in six-lined race runners to determine how they are impacted by variable substrates. 
The study shows race runners run non-randomly on substrates in the field by choosing to run on sand more often than debris, even though they run fastest on debris and slowest on sand in the lab. Their performance in the lab does not match their performance in the field. And these results suggest habitat and estate decisions could play an important role in explaining why these results occurred. So these are the references that I use in the PowerPoint. And that concludes my thesis presentation. So we'll move on to the Q&A portion of the different. Hey, thank you, Kayla. Um, so at this point, I think, um, does anybody can ask questions? So are there questions? I have a question. Yeah. Can you hear me? <laughs> First of all, bravo, Kayla, bravo, bravo. And uh, UNC grad myself, so awesome for Tar Heels. Um, okay, so I understood that you cut part of the tail off in the lab? I must have missed a little bit about, about that, but why why did you have to cut part of the tail off? Yes, so I cut just the top like one to two millimeters and I cut it in a, at an angle um, so that if I were to find the lizard again out in the field that I wouldn't collect the same lizard and run them twice. I um, got it, I got it. Okay, yeah. okay. Well, it was excellent and I, I appreciate you letting me zoom in on it. So thank you. Of course. I have a question. <laughs> okay, um, so you obviously did a lot of different um, methodologies here and um, as Dr. McElroy insinuated COVID played a little bit of a, a hiccup for you. Um, if you were to redo this study, is there anything you would do differently like add or subtract or something like that from the project? Yeah, so initially we had talked about adding in a choice experiment with it. Um, so having like two different substrates in the racetrack that the lizards would choose between one or the other. Um, so I think that would have been a really cool addition had we had more time um, and been able to collect more lizards and whatnot. Um, so if I had redone it all over again, I think that'd be something cool to add because I'd be interested to see the results from that. Okay, I know. Lucy, you can go. It's a very quick question. So I just, um, you talked about how you did most of your sampling in the summer. And I was just curious if you think any of that would change maybe in the fall during hurricane season or as seasons or foliage changes at all um, and how that might impact your results maybe? Yeah, good question. So race runners actually don't come out so they hibernate like during the winter and they come out like during mid to late April and then they hide in like August, September, depending on their age. The lizards typically aren't out. Well, I guess they are out some during hurricane season, um, but not, I guess, at the end. Um, so I, habitat could definitely change due to hurricanes. I mean, my habitat assessment data I collected this summer before we actually ran the other data. Um, and the dunes are expanding a little bit and obviously sand dunes, um, the vegetation on it can change. So it definitely could affect it, but also like, I think the amount of debris and everything would be similar probably throughout the years, unless there was a really bad hurricane. Um, so I would think the results would probably still be about the same. If that makes sense. Okay, I'm going to ask another question since everybody is quiet. Um, so I had the privilege of being a little bit more um, knowledgeable about this project than some other people, but for our less knowledgeable folks, can you maybe explain the noose that you use to catch the lizards? Because that was sort of mind blowing to me when I first uh, learned about what you were doing. Yeah, so the noose is actually on a fishing pole. So we like adapted a fishing pole and took off the hook from the end and put like a tiny little string. We use floss on some of them. Um, I'm not sure what the other stuff. Sur surgical, surgical thread's a little better because it floss just gets shredded. 
Okay, so um, surgical so. flaw or surgical string is what we use. And um, Eric just tied a little noose on the end. And then you basically walk through the dunes, you see a lizard, you can't get too near it because you'll scare it away. So you have to like creep up on it. And then, you know, the poles are like six feet long. So you basically have to stand there six feet away and then try to get this tiny little um, string over their head. And then you have to pull them up and not do it too much or else it'll, you know, break their neck. Um, and then you have to like grasp them and hold them and hope they don't escape because that has happened. Um, so it's a, it's a tedious process. And, and I'm going to add in here since there's this is a public defense and there are a bunch of people here. I've probably caught five between 500 and 1,000 lizards using this method, and I think I have mortally injured maybe one. Um, so it is it is very safe. Um, animals appear to be completely unharmed, except for one in 500 to 1,000 that might get hurt. Do they yeah. do they bite? Yeah. <laughs> okay. Okay. Yeah, they don't really hurt. It's more of like a surprise than anything. Um, I know they bit me some in the lab, and it was more just like, oh, I can't like believe it bit me more than like actually painful. I actually, yes. all my students are forced to be bitten um, <laughs> before they start really doing anything because these, these lizards are tiny. They're only you know as long as your hand, so it, it's it is startling not painful. Yeah. Go ahead, Lucy. Um, I, I just want to, one, I have been bitten by one of Kristen Horn, uh, uh, Kristen Gold's lizards. It doesn't hurt that bad, but um, I do want to ask a question um, specifically because this is an interdisciplinary program. So I know you didn't really talk too much about um, management or resource management. But how do you think these results that you had will impact resource management strategies or policies? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, I guess a lot of it is just like, at least here in South Carolina, these lizards are not endangered um, or anything like that, but they are good kind of indicators of habitat. And I know other studies have found like they're good indicators, especially of like um, fire restoration, like fire habitat. But I think just, just knowing more about their habitat and how they're affected by their habitat can help us to learn how like other animals are affected by their habitat, how like their survival will change in the future because the habitat keeps changing due to climate change. Um, the, the temperatures increase, you know, that can affect their survival. And if it affects their survival, it's going to affect other animals as well. Um, so yes, does that answer your question? Are there any other questions? Okay, so do we want to move to the just the committee part of the